guys. Welcome back to our teaching in the book of Exodus. Now, the last time we were here in chapter six, we basically were continuing on from Moses and Aaron's first interaction with Pharaoh. And basically, it seemed as if it was unsuccessful, but it was not unsuccessful. As a matter of fact, it became a foundational test ground for the interaction between Moses and the Pharaoh, that is, in how God would deal with the Pharaoh in his hardening of his own heart. So as Moses and Aaron went to the Pharaoh to tell him to let the people go, instead of Pharaoh letting the people go, he accused Moses as well as the Hebrew slaves of being lazy and he increased their labors upon them by commanding them to get their own straw. And so this already with slavery already being very difficult, made it become extremely unbearable. And therefore, because of the failure of the Hebrew slaves to, because remember now, they had a certain number of bricks that they were responsible for making. And since they added on the Hebrew slaves being responsible for finding their own straw, which the Egyptians normally had done in times before now, but with the Hebrew slaves now gathering their own straw, they were unable to produce the same number of bricks. So therefore this resulted in the beatings of the taskmasters and their accusations against Moses. So as they continued on in chapter six with this particular accusation that Moses had given the Hebrew, I'm sorry, the Egyptians a sword in their hands to kill them, by virtue of the labor and also the idea that they wouldn't be able to produce the number of bricks. And so therefore their beatings would lead to the deaths of the taskmasters. So Moses went and complained unto God. And this is what chapter six is all about. It is about addressing this issue that God is prepared to deliver the children of Israel. And so God, he tells Moses, return back to the children of Israel and tell them that the God of covenant, the God who made a covenant with their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is now prepared to keep that covenant to, and, and not so much as God was, had failed to keep his covenant, but the time for the keeping of the covenant was at hand. And this generation would experience the covenant keeping power of God. And that's what all of that issue was in chapter six about God saying that his name is Yahweh using the covenant name of God and that the forefathers, the ancestral fathers of the Jews did not know him by that covenant act of keeping the covenant. They knew him as a God of provision, El Shaddai, a God of power, a God of protection, but not the God who would actually perform the covenant. And that's what he was talking about. And so Moses went back to the children of Israel to tell them that, but because of the harshness of their labors, they refused to listen to Moses at all. And so God proceeds to tell Moses now to go and take this same message to Pharaoh to let the people go. And Moses began to complain and say that if the children of Israel would not listen to me, of course, Pharaoh would not listen to him as well. And Moses began to blame it on his ineloquence that he was not uh, uh, eloquent in speech. And so uh, God nevertheless sends Moses to Pharaoh. And this is the second time. And then there is this brief interruption that we see in chapter six. And it deals with this genealogy and all and, and go back and take a look at it, guys, because we can't deal with it now. But all of the genealogy was basically doing was identifying Moses, simply to say that it is this Moses and Aaron, Moses and Aaron, who came from Jacob, from the tribe of Levi, from the family of Amram and Yoshebed. This Moses is the Moses that God sent to lead the children of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt. And at the end of chapter six, it just simply catches back up again with or, or rehearses again when God is saying to Moses, go and tell Pharaoh to let the people go. And of course, Moses is complaining. So it is basically rehashing that all over again so that we can prepare ourselves to get into chapter seven as God now sends Moses unto the Pharaoh. Chapter seven. Then the Lord said to Moses, 
See, I make you as a God to Pharaoh and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you and your brother Aaron shall speak to Pharaoh that he let the sons of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. When Pharaoh does not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my hosts, my people, the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt by great judgments. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. So Moses and Aaron did it as the Lord commanded them. Thus they did. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. Okay. So now all chapter seven is doing is the continuation of the events from the time of Moses's complaint to God. Remember the sons of Israel said to Moses, you put a sword in their hands, the Egyptians to kill us. And Moses went to pray unto the Lord uh, about what to do next, basically in a nutshell. And so here he is, as God is now sending Moses, we have the continuation in chapter seven and Moses and God is dealing with Moses's resistance to going to Pharaoh because Moses is complaining that he is not eloquent in his speech and that he, he's not good with words. And so God says once again that he will now he will also send Aaron along with Moses. And this will be the way things will play out. Moses will be as God, as, as, as in the case of God. And what God is simply saying is by the word of Moses and the actions of Moses, Moses will be the one to appear to be the one doing all of these things. And he would use to satisfy Moses Aaron to speak directly to the Pharaoh. And this is simply done to satisfy Moses's complaint that Moses is not eloquent to speak. And so therefore Aaron will function as the prophet to Moses and Moses will be like God himself. When we know now God knows Moses knows and the Pharaoh knows that it is not Moses who is God, but Yahweh is God. That's why he says, you go and tell Pharaoh, thus save Yahweh, thus save the Lord. So he knows this, but he's just simply dealing with Moses's issue of being uh, ineloquent in his speech. And so God also says that he will harden Pharaoh's heart. Now I dealt with this particular principle of God's hardening Pharaoh's heart extensively in a video all by itself. I believe the passage was in Exodus chapter four and verse 21, but go and take a look at that. But nevertheless, so the issue would be as God is speaking here in general, that Moses will go unto the Pharaoh and Pharaoh's heart will be hardened. And you will find out that sometimes Pharaoh hardens his own heart and sometimes God hardens Pharaoh's heart. But here God speaks in general that he will harden Pharaoh's heart in order that he will display the signs and wonders in Egypt. So there is purpose to God's hardening Pharaoh's heart. And that is to show Egypt that God is God through mighty signs and wonders. And so God, he knows, so I don't want to even use the word anticipates, but nevertheless, he knows that Pharaoh would not listen to Moses. And so therefore, because Pharaoh would not listen to Moses, this will give God opportunity, reason to multiply, to increase the number of signs and wonders that he would perform on Egypt. And that's why we see the 10 plagues upon Egypt as God hardens Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh hardens his own heart. God gives, he increases the signs and wonders. And another thing too, concerning the plagues. And even before I get there, uh, when we see the plagues, there will basically be three groups of plagues, three groups of threes of the plagues, the first three, then the second set of three, then the third three, and then the last plague, the death of the firstborn of all of Egypt. 
and this will culminate all the plagues. So there will be basically three sets of plagues. And what we will see in each of these cases of the three sets of plagues is intensification. That is, it gets worse and worse upon Egypt. Okay. All right. So now with that said also, and God says this, and I want to deal with verse number five. He says, and the, one of the purposes of the plagues of Egypt, the signs and wonders, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when he, when I stretch out my hand upon Egypt. Now, this is very important to understand. Okay. We have to remember that Egypt is plagued with idolatry. All of the, all of the particular plagues that are going, that God is going to strike upon Egypt is going to be a strike upon the gods of Egypt. So it represents a strike upon the gods of Egypt, each plague. And what God is simply saying in each plague is that Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews is mightier than the idol gods of the Egyptians and Yahweh alone is God. And these others are simply idols. So the point that God is stressing in chapter in verse number five is by God's hand upon the Egyptians and striking the plagues. Remember this not only goes to the mind of Pharaoh and his servants, but all the Egyptian people as well, they will come to know without a shadow of a doubt that Yahweh, the God of, he of the Hebrews is truly God. Now, why am I taking time to express this? And what is God saying by this? Through these signs and wonders, the Egyptians have no excuse. They know by, by what God has done, they know that God is truly God. So when judgment comes upon the Egyptians, judgment is warranted. And okay, let me bring it home to you. Okay. For the most part, for the most part, it appears, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to be premature at the time as I usually am. There will be some who will depart from Egypt in the end, in the end of all things. Some who depart from Egypt with Moses, the Bible will call them a mixed multitudes. So you will have both the Israelite, the Jewish people, and you will have a multitude of other ethnicities. Some of them possibly maybe will be the Egyptians. Okay. But the idea is this, all those who left Egypt. Now this is the overriding idea other than with Israel. Israel is going to be delivered from uh, slavery through the power of God. So, so all of the Jews are going to be delivered. And this for the most part has nothing to do with whether or not they believe that Yahweh is truly God or not. This has nothing to do with that, whether they believe that Yahweh is God or not. God is simply delivering the Jews according to his covenantal promise that he made with Abraham. That's Genesis chapter 15. But concerning the mixed multitude and other ethnicities and peoples who left Egypt with uh, the Jewish people, these people may indeed be convinced that Yahweh is God through the signs and wonders. So therefore, by their leaving of Egypt, this seems to indicate that they have been convinced through all of the signs and wonders that they saw, and it may be some Egyptians along with them. The Bible is not specific about it, but it may be, it is an indication that through the powers that God, the miracles that God performed, they believe that Yahweh indeed is God. Now, again, why am I running this? Because this is what is necessary and, and let me say it in a simple sense to be saved, because in order to be saved, you are throughout every generation. And I don't have time to go with, go through all of this, but I, I made a video concerning this as well. But here's the point in order to be saved throughout every generation, 
every generation has always been saved by faith. That is by believing something, by believing something about God. Here, the Egyptians are being presented through signs and wonders that Yahweh indeed is God. So all they had to do, the Egyptians, was simply to believe that what the Hebrews God, Yahweh, is indeed God. And this would procure salvation for the Egyptians. The Egy in other words, the Egyptians would die. And as we'll simply say in a generic sense, go to heaven. Now, we know they would actually go to paradise at this particular time. They weren't going to heaven at this time. They were going to paradise and see the video that I made concerning that about the four compartments of Sheol. But nevertheless, they would die and go to, as we would say, heaven, paradise. They would be saved if they simply believed in the, Egypt, in the Hebrew God through God's performing of the signs. But the problem here is this. Even though God performed all of these signs before the Egyptians and the Egyptians themselves saw the miracles, experienced the miracles, experienced the judgments of God. Nevertheless, the Egyptians as a whole still rejected God and therefore the Egyptians themselves were lost or in other words, to simply say it, they went straight to hell. And that's the point that God is trying to make here. What? The Egyptians shall know that I am God. God performed all those signs before the Egyptians. If the Egyptians indeed believed what they should have done was turn to the God of the Hebrews and wisely what the Egyptians should have done was simply leave Egypt with Moses, but they didn't. Why? Because they did not believe. Okay. I went too far with that, but that's a point that I wanted to make concerning verse number five. And what was God's point? Through his signs, the Egyptians themselves would know that he is God as well as Israel would know that God is indeed God. And so this section ends with simply saying that Moses and Aaron uh, uh, did simply as the Lord had commanded them to do. And it sets out Moses age when Moses was 80 years of age and Aaron, his brother, three years older, 83 years of age. And this deals with the second part of Moses's life, or should I say the second division? Remember Moses life can be divided into three divisions. The first 40 years in Egypt as basically the prince of Egypt. The next 40 years, the time in the wilderness as the keeper of his father-in-law Jethro's flock and God's training him in, in shepherding. And then the next 40 years, his shepherding of Israel, leading them out of Egypt into the land of promise, even though we know Moses did not lead them into the land of promise, but that was what God had charged him to do. And that's basically how this verse ends. Moses is now keeping the charge of God, okay? Now we're ready for Moses' first interaction with Pharaoh with signs and wonder. Now that's the issue here. He has already gone to Pharaoh the first time, simply with the request. Pharaoh simply denied it and increased their burdens. Now he's going for the second time, and this time he will begin to perform the signs and wonders that God has set in his hand. Notably, one of the signs that Moses himself was given to, to show Israel, Israel, his own people, that God had chosen him to deliver them out of bondage. Okay, so now let's continue in verse number eight. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, when Pharaoh speaks to you saying, work a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh and thus they did just as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron threw his staff down before Pharaoh and his servants and it became a serpent. 
Then Pharaoh also called for the wise men and the sorcerers and they are, and they also the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts for each one through his staff and they turned into serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staff. Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not listen to them as the Lord has said. All right. Now we're dealing with the second interaction between Moses and Pharaoh. And of course, what is assumed, what is assumed is Moses going to Pharaoh with the command from God to let the people go. And so God knows that Pharaoh will ask for a miracle. And that is interesting. You know, it prepares us for this interaction and it speaks so much to us for the climate of, of occultism of what was going on in the days of Egypt. And I would really love to just dig into this, but I can't, we're just going to deal with Exodus. But the very atmosphere of occultism, occultism simply is dealing with the magical arts. And this is basically what we see here dealing with the magical arts and in the magical arts of occultism, this is done through satanic or demonic powers. So therefore what we find is what is embedded in all of this idolatry of Egypt, what is behind all of these things is demonic Powers. And that's why even the apostle Paul who says an idol is nothing for those who actually worship idols actually are worshiping demons themselves. And so there is a very strong occultic movement in all of Egypt in this magical arts. And this is what we're going to see, especially in the first three sign miracles of Moses here. And so there is an anticipation that Pharaoh will ask for a miracle. Prove it. If your God is truly God, then prove it with a miracle. And so he anticipates this. God anticipates this. And so he tells Moses to tell Aaron. And here we have to uh, know that there is a distinction here. There are times when God, when Moses tells Aaron to take Aaron's staff and cast it down. And sometimes Moses's staff is used and sometimes in the working of these miracles, no staff is used at all. Okay. But at this particular miracle here, the staff of Aaron is cast down before the magicians of Pharaoh. All right. And so Aaron, Moses tells Aaron, Aaron obeys. He casts his staff down before Pharaoh to satisfy Pharaoh with a miracle. And Aaron's staff turns into a living serpent by the power of God, by the power of God. Okay. And what happens? Pharaoh is not even amused at this. And this is amazing. That's what you need to see here. Pharaoh calls for his wise men. That is his counselors and his sorcerers, his occultic magicians to whom Paul in second Timothy names his sorcerer priests. Janus and Jambres, two of these leading priests, Janus and Jambres, who are responsible for withstanding Moses here with at this particular event. And what did they do with their secret arts? They did the same. But what you have to understand is Moses turned Aaron's staff into a serpent by the power of God. What the sorcerers of Pharaoh did was they also turn their staffs into serpents through the power of Satan. So let me pause and not be get too excited because I want you guys to really see this. This is not a maybe they did. The Bible is very clear that the magicians of the Pharaoh used their demonic occultic powers. That is the power of Satan to turn wood into a snake. This indicates for us that Satan has great power. And, and sometimes you'll see that word being used as authority, authority and power. 
basically almost means synonymous, the same thing. So with the authority of Satan, he has great power. And so we see that Satan actually can take that which is inanimate and give it life. Now, two things I want to say about that. The first thing is that this is the reason why we don't get too moved by people doing signs and wonders. That is, just because a person does something miraculous does not mean that it came from God. You can, a person can do a miracle and the miracle can actually be achieved by Satan himself because Satan has power to do miracles. However, Satan does not have the power of God. Notice in this circumstance, what happened? Aaron's rod swallowed up the rods of the Pharaoh. And we're gonna see this later on with the frogs and other things of that nature too. We're gonna see this as we move throughout these particular plagues that even the magicians of, of Pharaoh with their occultic arts energized by the power of Satan, they will get to a particular point and they will say unto the Pharaoh, this is the hand of God. We cannot duplicate this particular miracle. But my point that I'm trying to say here is this, Satan has limited power. He has great power, but those powers are limited. He is never able to deal with the power of God. The power of God is always greater. So that's one of the first things I want to say. Now, let me talk about the second thing about the working of powers and miracles. Maybe let me, let me move it to three. I guess I do it in three, three ways. The second thing is that the working of powers is never uh, by men is not a, I'm talking about evil men here. It's not a one time event that is done by the magicians of Pharaoh. Later on, we will see, and this is why the Antichrist comes into power here. And I can't deal with it. I would really love to, but I can't. But I'm in Revelation chapter 13, and I'm also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul talks about the Antichrist in both 2 Thessalonians 2 and, Rev and, and we know St. John wrote Revelation. So Revelation 13, but both of them are talking about the powers of the Antichrist and how that the Antichrist will be able to work great miracles and even the prophet to the Antichrist. And that's in the second section of the, of the Revelation 13. That, and that is the false prophet. He also will have the ability to work miracles. And, and this is what, and, and in the same sense, and this is why I'm spending a little time, in a semblance of what is taking place here, what happened here? In the first miracle, the magicians of the Pharaoh made an inanimate object, something that has no life. They gave it life through the power of Satan. Later on, when the Antichrist himself comes into power, his false prophet will create an image and it will probably be an image of the Antichrist, similar to what we saw in the book of Daniel, when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and, 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 and this dream of a, a, a body of a man, later on, Nebuchadnezzar himself creates an image and tells everybody to worship it, which probably was an image of himself. But the point is, the false prophet will take this image of the Antichrist, which will be in, in the temple of God. He will give life to the image. In other words, he will cause something that is not alive to become alive. And the scripture says it will live and speak. Okay. So, and now that just blows my mind. But again, I'm saying all of this simply to say the power of Satan. Okay. The power of Satan. So Satan has great power. That power never rivals the power of God. And in the end time, Satan will give power to the man of his choosing. That is his own son, the Antichrist. And I did several videos on things related to that. Okay. And now let me say one final thing concerning miracles. 
One of the reasons why a miracle is a miracle is because they were not done often. And there were basically three times in scripture that we saw miracles. That is this time that Moses is going unto Pharaoh. Then again, we saw a season of miracles with the prophet Elijah, Elijah, Elisha. Okay. So when we say Moses, consider it like Moses, Joshua, miracle time. Then Elijah, Elisha, miracle times. And then third time, Jesus and the apostles times of miracles. So they were rarely done and they were done only at certain seasons. Now there will be one more time of miracles and it will be the final time of miracles, which will precede the coming of Jesus to the earth. The second coming will be preceded and that will be done. And now I'm in revelation chapter 11, the two witnesses as well as the antichrist and the false prophet. This will bring in the final age of miracles right before the second advent of Jesus Christ. Okay. So that's all I want to say about the miracle parts, but nevertheless, so what is the response? Moses is, I'm sorry, <laughs> Aaron's rod swallowed up the rod of the Pharaoh's servants and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He paid no attention to that. In other words, God did not convince him with that first sign. All right, let's continue because I think this is getting a little longer than need be. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water and station yourself to meet him on the bank of the Nile. And you shall take in your hand the staff that was turned into a serpent. You shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But behold, you have not listened until now. Thus saith the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the water that is in the Nile with the staff that is in my hand and it will be turned to blood. The fish that are in the Nile will die and the Nile will become foul and the Egyptians will find difficulty in drinking water from the Nile. Okay, let me stop there because that can be kind of extensive and narrative. So now let's start. All right. So now the Lord says to Pharaoh, he said, take a look, look at, look at, I'm sorry. The Lord says to Moses, take a look at Pharaoh. His heart and his heart and Pharaoh is, is angry about that. And one of the reason you see Pharaoh's heart is hardened and it doesn't say whether God hardened Pharaoh's heart or Pharaoh's hardened his own heart. It just simply lets us know Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And one of the reason that we can see this often is coming from Pharaoh is because Pharaoh himself was considered to be a God. Pharaoh was called Horus, the son of what is a Hathor or something of that nature, but son of Ra, ultimately the son, ultimately the son of this God, the son of Amen Ra. And Pharaoh was considered Horus, a God himself. And so therefore Pharaoh didn't appreciate Moses and his desert God coming and telling Pharaoh a God himself with the powerful gods of Egypt telling Pharaoh what to do. And so therefore we can see Pharaoh's heart stiffening up. He didn't appreciate what had just happened. And so therefore God says, go to him again. And now we begin with the plagues of Egypt and that's in the water of the of blood, water into blood. So now what we have to understand is this concern. Remember again, when the plagues hit, it is always against the gods of Egypt. Okay. And Egypt had many gods and I don't even want to get into all of the gods. So as I talk about some of these plagues, I'll only mention a few of the gods that God himself, the God of 
of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is striking a few of these gods that God is striking because they got so many have a pantheon of different gods. Even the Nile had many gods associated with the Nile. But anyway, let me get into the commentary so I can take you into basically what was happening. So, uh, and, and also too concerning these plagues as we're getting into them. The plagues did not occur over a long period of time. Probably these 10 plagues took a uh, uh, struck Egypt in the time of about period of about six to nine months, anywhere from a six to nine months, the plagues hit. So within six to nine months and what you have to understand about the plagues, what you must understand about the plagues of Egypt, they destroyed Egypt. Egypt was destroyed when they left Egypt. Okay. But let's get into it. What's the scenario going on? Strike the Nile and turn the Nile into blood. That's this particular plague. Go and meet Pharaoh in the morning. Okay. Now the Nile was the source of life in Egypt. That is the, the waters of the Nile. And periodically the Nile would overflow its banks. And when it would overflow its banks, it will literally fertilize all those crescent areas around the Nile and it would become agriculturally very rich. And the Nile was also itself rich in fish and, 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 live, and livelihood that people would get from the Nile. So they would get a lot of their livelihood from the different fish and even it, it, the, uh, the crocodile gods of the Nile, but I don't really get all of that. So the Nile was very central to the idolatrous theology of Egypt as well as the agricultural success of Egypt. And this, you'll always, you'll find this very common in, in pagan cultures that they would often associate agriculture with idolatry. In, in, in other words, they would be looking to their idol gods to bless them agriculturally because if they did not appease their idols, make their idols happy in some way, their idols would strike the land and the land would not produce and the people would not benefit. The people may starve or whatever. So that's the idea. So the Nile was very central to the Egyptian God, uh, pantheon of gods and agricultural life. And so it was customary for, for, for during the time when the Nile would periodically rise that the Pharaoh would come out and commemorate the event. And this seems like the time in which God tells Moses to go and meet the Pharaoh as the Pharaoh is commemorating the event for the gods of the Nile. And, and, and one of the gods of the Nile was Hopi, Hopi. And this was a, 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 a and they would have this andro androgynous gods, a god who had male and female characteristics, androgynous god. This god uh, uh, pictured by the Egyptians had the breasts of a woman and like the body of a man. It was a weird looking God, <laughs> Hopi, who was the God of Egypt, as well as Osiris also was a God of the Egypt, uh, of the Nile, I'm sorry, God of the Nile, Hopi, God of the Nile, Osiris, God also of the Nile. Remember, there are many gods of Egypt, many gods of the Nile. And it was said concerning Osiris that the waters of the Nile were the blood that flowed through the vein of Osiris. So you can see how God is striking the gods of Egypt. Clearly here, Hopi, and clearly here, Osiris. And what does he tell him to do? Turn the waters into blood. And this brought forth death. Now, what you have to understand is this. What is the result of this action? All the fish died. And remember now, you have to look at this scaling as far as economy is concerned. Imagine a, a people as a whole who gather so much of their economy of fish, 
from the Nile and the whole Nile is turned to blood. Not only that, the riverbanks and everything else and all of the fresh water, but we'll get into that too. Okay, okay, okay. But I don't wanna get into the results right now, but just let me just simply deal with the results to the God. So what God is simply doing here is striking the gods of the Nile with death. That which the Egyptians worshiped because they sought the Nile as bringing life to Egypt. The Nile brought life to Egypt. What brought life to Egypt, God brought death, showing that I am stronger than the gods of Egypt. Okay, so now enough of that. Now let's go into what actually happened. Verse number 18. The fish, I'm sorry, 19. Then the Lord said to Moses, Santa Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, over their streams, over their pools, over all their reservoirs of water, that they may become blood. And there will be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and vessels of stone. So Moses and Aaron did even as the Lord commanded. And he lifted up the staff and struck the water that was in the Nile, in the sight of Pharaoh, in the sight of his servant, and all the water that was in the Nile turned into blood. The fish that were in the Nile died. The Nile became foul so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile, and the blood was through all the land of Egypt. Okay. So now what happened as God told Moses to strike the Nile, he obeyed and the Nile turned into blood. But remember, not only verse number 19, did the Nile turn into blood, all the waters of Egypt turned into blood, all the waters turn of Egypt turned into blood. And, and what happened? And even the waters of the fresh stream. Okay. Let me, let me just skip all of that. There was no water to drink. And that's the problem. There is no water to drink. The fish died and the people began to thirst. So not only did it destroy the fishing economy, not only did it do that, but the people themselves thirsted of water and we'll find out that it lasted for seven days and the people had to, and I'm premature, but they ended up having to dig water. But let me deal with this point in verse number 19, when it talks about the water that was turned into blood in the vessels of wood and stone. This is giving a reference back to those artifacts that was using in worship of the idols. So what, 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 this is what God was doing. You see, it, they would have vessels when they would worship their idol gods, say for instance, Hopi or Osiris. And as they would worship their idol gods in special vessels, special vessels, God made certain to strike the waters because they would take the waters from the Nile and pour it out in, in worship, okay, to the idol gods. God made special attention to those vessels to turn the water in those sacred vessels to those idol gods into blood. And that's what he's saying by the vessels of wood and stone to make certain to even that those vessels <laughs> the God of the Hebrews is greater than the God of the Nile, or should we say the gods of the Nile? And so it struck him. The people had no water. All the fish died. Verse number 22. But the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts and Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said, then Pharaoh turned and went into his house with no concern even for this. So all the Egyptians dug around the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink the water of the Nile. Seven days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. Okay, so now let's wrap it up. So what happened? When Moses struck the Nile and it turned into blood, Notice once again, 
as remember now, Aaron's rod was turned into a serpent. Pharaoh's magicians did the same thing. Those same magicians are doing it again. They are duplicating a miracle of God. So that's what we need to see again. And that uh, goes back to all that stuff I was saying about Satan. Satan can duplicate God's miracle, but he cannot overcome God in power. He can duplicate some, and he can't duplicate all of the miracles of God. Because as we're going to move through these plagues, we're going to find out some of the, the magicians of Pharaoh will not be able. They're going to get to a point where they cannot duplicate it anymore. So Satan can do some of the things that God can do, but he cannot do all of the things that God can do. He doesn't have God's power. And this is what we see with the Egyptian uh, magicians here. They go and where did they get the water? Since Moses struck all the water, they had to go and dig into the ground through, through the soil because, you know, water would come through soil and then it would create little puddles of water in the soil. And this is where they found the water. And these magicians likewise turned the water into blood. Simply to say again, Satan has power and they turn the water into blood again. But what is kind of ridiculous about it is this. Remember the results of turning the water into blood. Fish die, agriculture will suffer because the Nile is not, not overflowing and giving fertility is producing death and foulness of the water. So it is a foolish thing to reduplicate the miracle, but nevertheless they did. So that hurting themselves. But the whole point is, Satan was able to reduplicate that miracle. The response of Pharaoh, his heart was hardened. He paid no attention to that. He went into his own house and this uh, plague of the waters being turned into blood lasted upon Egypt for seven days. All right, guys, thanks for joining me on the first beginning of these plagues upon Egypt. Remember, this is just the beginning and this is set number one. As we move through the plagues, we'll find out that there will be an intensification. Things will become worse and worse. And although Satan here is displaying great power, he will continue to, dis great, to, to display great power. But he himself will get to a point where he cannot withstand the power of God. All right, guys, look for your next time.